to laugh. I was going to say there's something up there I mean, very important I want you to attend to. But it was the email um, to log in the code. Okay, well, um, I want to talk about values of mathematics, and I want to distinguish between overt and covert uh, mathematics. Uh, <coughs> values. And then there are some points of contact with what Alan has said. It's taken me a long time to sort of get my head around some of the, the values that Alan identified drawing on white. That, that, that it's they've taken a while to germinate for me. For some reason, I struggle with them. But now they're coming more to seem more and more important and central to me. So, so, uh, that, and so some of them will be reflected in what I say. Um, but I'm coming at it from a, I'm trying to come from a philosophical perspective, although real philosophers will probably uh, sneer at that, possibly. Um, so values of mathematics, and I want to distinguish between over and covert. And uh, and I think that was part of what was underpinned some of what Alan was saying too. You know, can we teach uh, values explicitly in mathematics, or can mathematics teaching be a vehicle for, for values in some other way rather than being explicit? Well, I shan't be addressing that at all. Okay. Uh, values in mathematics? It, it's widely perceived, as a lot of acknowledged earlier, but also by, you know, in lots of literature, that values only enter, in, enter into mathematics as a subjective dimension manifested in preferences or choices of mathematicians. But going back to Plato, he argued for the object objectivity of values such as truth, good, and beauty, implying that values are, are at the center of epistemology, ethics, and aesthetics. And furthermore, by saying that these things exist, he's uh, asserting their obje objective existence. He's bringing ontology into the domain of values as well. Uh, at least, it's opening up for me to draw ontology in. From this perspective, the values in these philosophical domains are central to mathematics too, I want to argue, and I want to look at that in more detail. Controversially, it follows that mathematics has values from epistemology, ethics, aesthetics, and ontology. This is not an argument, this is not a proof I'm offering. I shall illustrate with examples how I, I dare make such claims. Uh, but I want to start by categorizing mathematical values, distinguishing in, uh, inner intrinsic values of mathematics, which apply to mathematicians, perhaps unconsciously, um, uh, and characterize the practices of mathematicians, the inside values within mathematics as a field of study or whatever, or as an area of knowledge, and the outer or extrinsic values perceived by non mathematicians, the public, users of mathematics, outsiders, should we say. Mathematics, and, and this is mathematics viewed from the outside, from the societal or non-mathematicians' perspective, there are different values there. And within the inner values, I want to distinguish between overt values explicitly acknowledged by mathematicians and covert values that are tacit, hidden, or otherwise unacknowledged. And I feel part of my joy and task is to try and open them up, whether you'll be convinced that I've found hidden values within mathematics, we'll see. <coughs> I want to claim that the latter are, I believe, that the latter are equally present and equally, if not more important, than the overt values. And uh, I'm representing these diagrammatically with this iceberg. How does it look to you? A bit dim, but you get the idea. So I've got my overt inner values at the top, that's the visible bit. I've got my covert inner values down below, and then all around it are the social values that are outside of it. Oh. It, it locates them geographically and spatially. And the focus of my talk, I'm going to focus on inner values, um, the overt values of mathematics, and the covert values of mathematics. And I'm going to leave aside the third domain, outer or extrinsic values of mathematics, and perhaps that's more suitable for the third conference. And, uh, and so I'm not going to touch on it here, with one tiny little bit of speculation at the end of my talk. And I put, uh, so I put to one side outer extrinsic values, and I, I, I love cartoons, I don't know how relevant it is, but you know, an image of mathematics from the outside sometimes is uh, one of horror, not always, mathematics is often the most popular subject in primary school, but um, um, I once saw a book with a hundred different uses of Edward Munch's screen in different <laughs> cartoons and contexts, and so it's quite interesting to see one here applied to mathematics. When is the test? And what is the benign binomial theorem? Horror, uh, panic. That's the outside. That's 
one element of some of the perspectives or views of mathematics, beliefs about it, uh, you know, which might tip into values. So that's a kind of parting jokey shirt. Overt inner values. Truth. Surprising, perhaps, that the relevance of truth to mathematics is a matter of values. Uh, for the for, quest for, for truth and knowledge is intrinsic to mathematics. It's obvious that truth is to be referred to falsehood in mathematics, and I want to argue that any preference is a statement of values. So our, tr our cleaving to truth is a statement of values. <coughs> and in this uh, uh, sculpture, we have truth overcoming falsehood, unmasking him, and see the mask over the head, and pulling out his forked tongue. <coughs> Getting to truth. This is attributed to George Brack, and, it, and uh, you may not be able to read it, but, but here, there, it says, um, truth exists, without a question mark, that's my question mark, and only falsehood has to be invented, and that's also my question mark, because it's asserted there. Well, I think it's a deeply dubious claim. And uh, another illustration, in this, in this, uh, Painting, truth symbolically holds a mirror because it provides an immediate, accurate, true image of the world. So that stands for truth, that mirror. Um, knowledge is the mirror of nature, to paraphrase royalty. Well, actually, he was talking about philosophy as a mirror of nature, but, but the idea that a mirror gives you truth because it, it cannot distort what is actually there. It's immediate. I want to critique that notion. Truth needs warranty. There, there is a mistaken view, not, not particularly in mathematics, it's a mistaken view that truth presents itself and can be seen immediately and directly. And I reject that, uh, because um, the direct self-warranting of mathematical knowledge by intuition is inadequate. Um, you know, the intuitionists, you know, Brouwer, etc., try to argue for a basis of intuition that they could erect all the mathematics, but not even the intuitionists can agree among themselves, constructivists agree among themselves about how to rebuild mathematics, and certainly classical mathematics rejects their intuitions, their view, and uh, we do not all share the same intuition, and our other arguments could be given why direct self-warranting of mathematical knowledge is just simply inadequate. So mathematical knowledge must be warranted indirectly by reasoning or proof. So, uh, so with this indirect access to mathematical truth, to establish the truth of mathematical knowledge, we use reason or proof, and we must have four things. One, a starting set of true axioms or postulates. Um, two, an agree agreed set of rules of proof that preserve truth. Three, a guarantee that the rules of proof are adequate to establish all truths of mathematics, completeness. Four, a guarantee that the rules of proof are safe, warranting only the truth of, math of the mathematical system, consistency. And I won't go into these much more, just to say that each of these conditions raises technical problems, such as limitations due to Gödel's incompleteness theorems for numbers three and four. But there, there are problems with all of these, um, and I won't, uh, I, I, I won't make too much of a case of that. Truth needs warranting. Oh, did I get? I went backwards. Sorry. Um, attaining the value of truth in mathematics is problematic. Um, and constructing proof for mathematical claims is difficult enough, even though it remains a poor surrogate for truth. But, you know, having just pointed out there are technical difficulties in establishing truth through proof, um, I want to assert that truth and provability remain central epistemological values within mathematics. Now, a question you might ask is, is the identification of truth as, as a central value in mathematics trivial? Uh, all knowledge quests must be concerned with truth and degrees of proof. But, but truth is the first overt value of mathematics and it contradicts the claim that mathematics is value free. This is why I'm starting by focusing on truth. It's certainly one of the ones that Plato uh, picked up. Thus, the heart of the mathematical uh, enterprise is value driven. And just to list some other overt values in mathematics, um, without dwelling on them too much. It's, uh, I've, I've named them uh, ontological universalism, uh, the, 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 the view, now this is, this is where it gets close to beliefs, but by cleaving to this belief it becomes a value, <coughs> to argue. 
Mathematical objects and classes of entities exist for all persons of all possible life forms. So that's a, that corresponds loosely with Platonism or realism. Ontological uh, objectivism, there are mathematical objects and classes of entities which exist independently of the perspective, beliefs, or con conceptual scheme of any particular person's society or possible life form. Again, this, this corresponds to uh, <coughs> Platonism and realism, or can be associated with it. Uh, epistemological universalism, there are classes of mathematical statements which hold in all contexts at all times and for all persons and possible life forms. So this corresponds to absolutism or certainty. And uh, epistemological objectivism, there are classes of mathematical statements which hold independently <coughs> of the perspective, beliefs, or conceptual scheme of any particular person, society, or possible life form. And finally, uh, rationalism, logical thought, and abstract reasoning are valued in mathematics above all else. Not by human choice, it's claimed, within the overt values, but by the very nature of mathematics itself. <coughs> I want to claim, however, that these are values, that, that they're not forced upon us, but they, they are concomitant with the end, when we join the enterprise, that they, they seem to go with them. So, but these are overt values. And, and I notice there are certain things here that I'm sharing with Alan. Um, rationalism was one of his, and I'm sure I saw something else. Like <coughs> but there'll be more. Sorry? Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. But I'm going to distinguish objectivism from objectivism, which is particularly out. And now, moving to beauty and aesthetics, and I breathe a sigh of relief in this morning's lecture that I hadn't omitted it. Um, but, um, but anyway, uh, certainly within mathematics, it seems to me that beauty and aesthetics is one of the clear, um, quite widely agreed, sets of values. Beauty and aesthetics are widely remarked as attributes of mathematics and entered into and they enter into mathematicians' judgments and their activities in appreciating, formulating, and creating mathematics, irrespective of the argument or whether it's discovered or invented. In case you haven't guessed, I'm of the, in, I'm of the invented school, but I, this is uh, independent of that. Mathematical beauty can be attributed to lots of things in mathematics, to propositions, theorems, concepts, methods, proofs, theories, applications, norms, <coughs> symbolism, etc. All the mathematical objects may be beautiful, can be, have beauty attributed to them. But what criteria and aspects determine beauty in mathematics? So I've been racking my brains on this and I see that some of the papers being offered here are doing some really interesting things and looking at ideas of, you know, empirically at, at, at values and beliefs and, and so my answer is top down, it's out of my own head with, with reference to the literature. So I, I've come up with six dimensions of mathematical beauty. I'm not claiming this is complete or that even that they, are, um, that they don't overlap perhaps. Um, in particular I put elegance in the first group but there are ways in which it might fit into some other dimensions. But let me go through my six clusters of dimensions of mathematical beauty. So the first one, succinctness economy, simplicity, elegance. And um, that, that's a feature that's valued, that's something that's, that can be viewed as beautiful. Um, the compression of a formula or theorem of wide generality or a proof into a few short signs is valued in the mind. And not only valued in, yes, it's, it's looked upon with pleasure. It's hard to define beauty, but it's kind of a response to something that gives you pleasure. So I didn't use the word, I put a mark that almost it's pleasure, but I think pleasure comes into the music. Another one is generality, abstraction, and power. The breadth and scope of the generality or proof also evokes appreciation. My third category is surprise, ingenuity, cleverness. Unexpectedness, like wit, is appreciated and valued when it reveals new knowledge connections and links. And then one that's closer to the visual arts, pattern, structure, symmetry, visual design. Uh, appreciation of form and pattern in mathematics, through, although abstract, is close to the visual aesthetics of art, by which I mean painting, I suppose, but also sculpture and other forms of three, you know, two or three dimensional representation. Mm -hmm. uh, my fourth category is uh, logical reasoning, deduction, rigor, purity. Uh, some, one of the things that's valued and, and regarded as beautiful in mathematics. 
The rigor and purity of logic and reasoning is uniquely valued in quantum mathematics. A good proof is like a perfect gold chain with unbreakable links. Well, that's a metaphor, but you know that you know, I get a sense of that wonderful and beautiful thing. And then finally, uh, the utility, if you like, applicability, modeling power. That also gives. I'm a bit more pure, but you know, sometimes when you see how a simple formula can capture a whole set of phenomena, there's a kind of beauty and a kind of uh, you know, ah, oh, uh, when, when you see that. that uh, I'm sorry, really speaking. Um, models and applied theories demonstrate real-world power, and so I'm using power in a different sense from what I did earlier. Um, and un unreasonable effectiveness, to quote Wigner, uh, of the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in, in the world, in the physical world. So those are my six dimensions. I'd be interested to hear if uh, people think I've left something out or that there are overlaps, because it's just the first attempt. <coughs> An example, it's a rather simple example. A beautiful simple proof, question mark. Um, the following is an elementary example exhibiting mathematical beauty, I claim. Um, drawing on the proof that a sum of 1 to n is, you know, n times n plus 1 over 2. As is well known, the proof involves the following key step, the sum of n pairs of algebraic terms, each totaling n plus 1. So I tried to, or oh, I see I failed a bit with my, um, my underlines to show the additions. But anyway, you get the idea. 1 over n gives n plus 1. Um, mm -hmm. 2 over n minus 1 gives, um, well, I, I want to say over, I mean added to, etc. And then the beauty is that the same thing is repeated. I have to turn the other way. Um, mm -hmm. There's a symmetry. And let me show you uh, a small sketch relief. This was just a sketch because it was never made into an exhibited work of art in my possession because my father. Uh, had a love of mathematics, John Ernest, and he did other things. But, uh, it, it, was, it just I happened to have to hand this uh, a small sketch relief illustrating this proof. And I don't know if you can see, I'm going to say how it relates. But the dot, dot, dot is there. And then you've got three terms, equivalent to three terms, top. Uh, so it's the top two lines of, the, of the, this algebraic sum. And the way it relates is. Um, the algebraic sum, the top two lines correspond to, the top, correspond to the sketch I just showed you. The black squares represent units, black columns implicitly represent n black squares, and white squares represent negative numbers. And, and so you can see in a way that, um, so here you've got um, n and 1, and here you've got, um, you've also got n and 1, and that would be no, no, I've got it wrong. This is n, and that's 1 in the other half above the line, uh, etc. I mean, counting the squares and regarding them as a positive or negative, and, and the columns as being n, it works. It works. I'm just not explaining it well. My point is that there's a beautiful symmetry between the first and last three terms. It's an order to rotation. You also have a near reflective symmetry about horizontal and vertical axes, in well, top of the colors. And the figure brings out pleasing structural features of the proof. There's also the ingenuity and cleverness of the proof. Summing of terms is elegantly simplified, as in the well-known story of Gauss at school, who summed the numbers 1 to 100 in seconds using its logic, you know, first and last, etc. This story, this story is told to stress the teacher's surprise at Gauss's ingenuity and cleverness. And another pleasing aspect of the proof is its generality and power applicable to the first n numbers for any n. So I've tried to pull out some of the things that I regard as elements of mathematical beauty or aesthetics in this very simple example. <coughs> I can't resist a card too. And here again you have, uh, so this was on, on, um, uh, on with Google. It's, I guess it's a teacher or someone who sees the link between a simple equation, <coughs> a set of t uh, table of values, and a, a, a line graph, regarding it as beautiful and a little tear in his eye. Well, you don't find many cartoons about maths and beauty. So I've been talking about overt values in mathematics, and I talked about truth, some other things with double barrel names mostly, and then uh, beauty. And now I want to talk about. Um, Covert inner values of mathematics. And in some sense, this is, the, I hope, less obvious, but maybe more objectionable. 
Mathematics is infused with covert values which are often hidden or denied or regarded as universal and necessary properties. Covert values are not, are not necessarily harmful or negative, the fact that they're hidden, but negative consequences do follow in some cases. And I first want to start by saying the denial and rejection of these as values of mathematics is itself a values position. When you say mathematics is value-free, that is a values position. Now, this is one uh, that I took from Alan Bishop. Um, ob objectism, not objectivism, but objectism. It's a worldview dominated by images of material objects. And he, he spoke about this earlier. And, and I want to argue that this deeply permeates mathematics, mathematical thinking. And it has done so since its inception in, in the systematic accounting that was used and uh, developed in, in Mesopotamia and Egypt, to, um, and maybe elsewhere. But uh, I know certainly in Mesopotamia and later Egypt, due to the need for records for trade, taxation, and scribal training. Indeed, Hoyrup, uh, who I quote there, says that mathematics as a discipline was invented there when things were systematized in writing to train for scribal training. And ob objectivism underpins that. The basis of mathematics is counting, measuring, calculating, and the symbolic technology in the numeration system to provide a cognitive underpinning of this and to record it. But the idea of counting material objects is not naturally given, however simple and obvious it looks to the modern eye, who, who all of us have been schooled in this outlook since the age of five, or earlier or later. So in other words, the way we look at material objects and constitute them in our field of awareness, objectism, is something that we've taught, we've been taught, that we've acquired. Mathematics is, is based on an assumed objectist conceptualizing the world. The preconceptions involved include the following. The world is first understood as made up of objects, permanent or semi-permanent entity, entities, individuated and distinguished. And of course this emerged initially in the idea of in trade. You know, they were either baskets of grain or flat, you know, or um, amphoras of oil or loaves of bread or pigs or sheep or whatever, objects or, or ingots of metal, whatever it is they were trading. Those were understood as those objects or collections, which were themselves objects, were understood as permanent or semi-permanent. Objects themselves form kinds, and for accounting purposes, objects are interchangeable and treatable as equivalent units. Objects of a kind can be physically made into unified collections, and this extends to multiple kinds that can be uh, collected together, and conceptual collections. So we then move on that you, in your mind you can associate these. This, of course, is well known as happening in the psychology of, of learning mathematics, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what happened in history, the kind of thought process that developed historically. The processes of accounting and accounting are applicable to any collection, uh, conceptualized as an unchanging entity, or else counting is invalidated. So we impose a kind of static nature on things that we're counting. Uh, if they start, you know, if you're, if you're, if it takes so long count, so long counting that you're rabbits of breeding and you're getting more than you started with, then, uh, then the, the, the counting is invalid. <laughs> Any collection of objects can be counted, resulting in an invariant number, it's the cardinality of the collection. Um, all that sounds trivial, but what I'm saying is that you have to see things as objects that you can treat as unities that you can manipulate and put together before you can impose counting. And that's objectism. And once you have, as you start manipulating collections of objects, mentally and physically, with the assumptions of objectism, the basic laws of arithmetic follow if addition is understood as the operation of combining collections, set union, that there's a kind of natural set union given by, by you know, collecting or separating, etc. And, and um, uh, it's very easy to see how uh, um, symmetry and associativity follow from for addition, follow from that. So then you have some, the basis of, that the physical needs for accounting, etc., and a, 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 for trade lead to a, a way of conceptualizing it with certain assumptions, and that leads to the necessity of certain properties for arithmetic. Uh, those are not given by the universe, they're given by humanly chosen, valued activities. That's my claim. Objectism is not a necessary worldview. Objectism is not necessary. Uh, its necessity arises because of the social need for numeration systems which are invariant, 
with respect to process of accounting and calculating for taxation and trade. <coughs> it's possible to imagine that mathematics might have developed without the assumptions of objectism if, for example, ritual and mystical functions had been in dominant uses of number. I know I'm in the realm of science fiction here. Uh, it's, it's, it's not very likely, but because, you know, practical necessity is what drove the creation of the arithmetic, number, and hence mathematics. But my claim is that objectism represents a choice, a set of values adopted for contingent reasons in the history of mathematics. And this choice of values has implications in both epistemological and ethical domains. So, unpicking objectism. Right? And it looks obvious, sometimes looking at what seems obvious is actually unpicking what something we've, we've taken on board and, and hardly were aware that we'd adopted this perspective and the values that go with it. <coughs> so that was objectism. Ethics. Ethics, ethical values permeate mathematics in several ways. First of all, I want to draw on the work of Carol Gilligan, who wrote a book in a different voice in 1982, a feminist researcher, who distinguished separated from connected values. And I want to claim that these are applicable to mathematics. Separated values, the separated position values rules, abstraction, objectification, impersonality, unfeelingness, dispassionate reasoning and analysis, and tends to be atomistic and thing centered. Co the connected position value, uh, values relationships, connections, empathy, caring, feelings and intuition, and tends to be holistic and human centered in its concerns. So we've got a dichotomy, if you like, two sets of, of contrasting values. So the separated values are rules, the, the things that are valued are rules, abstraction, objectification, impersonality, unfeelingness, atomistic, dispassionate reasoning, and analysis. And you can see the corresponding connected values, which are mostly I already read to pull out. Separated values apply to mathematics. Mathematical objects result from object objectification and abstraction and are naturally impersonal and unfeeling. Uh, mathematical structures are made up of abstract, rule-based sets of objects and their relationships. The processes of mathematics are atomistic and object-centered, and they're based on a dispassionate analysis and reason in which personal feelings play no part, even if working with mathematics may be accompanied by personal feelings. Separated values apply to mathematics very well, I'm claiming. Uh, mathematics embodies and transmits these values irrespective of any argument as to whether they're an essential part of mathematics. They're, they are part of mathematics, you know, we can argue about why they're there. Rejecting connected values in favor of separated values supports the view that mathematics has no human or ethical responsibilities. But that, the adoption of that view is itself an ethical position, to say it's ethics free, or it doesn't need ethics, or ethics are irrelevant. The implications of, se of separated values is that uh, mathematics itself has no responsibility for how it's taught or applied, and I'm not necessarily critiquing this at this stage. Adopting connected values for teaching or using mathematics is all to the good, but is another story. It's that's an application, what, you know, that clearly what you do in the classroom is value laden, irrespective of if you think mathematics is value free, because education is on itself a value laden activity. But mathematics itself from a separated values position, is free from this responsibility. It belongs to teachers and the social institutions of mathematics, but um, not that you know, those responsibilities belong there, not to the discipline itself. So uh, separated values mean that mathematics has no social responsibility. And of course that's quite a widely held view, not necessarily on the basis of separated values, they may be seen to be an intrinsic part of the study, rather than choice. Moving on to other values, openness, fairness, democracy, and this echoes again some of what we heard from Albert because openness was one of his categories, and he, and he linked it to democracy. And fairness kind of is implicit in what we heard. Mathematical knowledge is justified, is justified by proof which embodies democracy, for it opens up the basis of knowledge to all, whether they be a shopkeeper presenting a bill for purchases, which you can check, well, that used to be true, but actually in a supermarket, if you look at the bill and there's something wrong, they call the supervisor because the computer says it's right. 